Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, be with us now as we continue our work as a diocese dedicated to the mission of your Son, Jesus Christ. And may the breath of the Holy Spirit envelop us this day as we continue our work as the Diocese of Washington, your Church, the Body of Christ during times of great challenge and change. May we be as faithful to you as your Son continues to be faithful to us. Help us to carry forward Christ's mission in ways that help us redefine the meaning of Pentecost in the 21st century to a 21st century hungry for the bread of the gospel. Help us to feed your church through the vision and work of fearless leaders who have been empowered by the waters of baptism. Help us to be evangelists for the church and not merely maintenance managers. Help us to be a church that preaches and lives into a gospel that lifts up new possibilities for living and reinforces hopefulness for a more expansive and better life for all God's people, both churched and unchurched. Help us to be as contagious as the common cold and as warm and embracing as a gentle summer breeze. May we find ourselves finally convicted by the gospel of Jesus Christ and may our sentence be lived out once more, rededicating ourselves to reshaping a church too often found guilty of ministering from the perception of scarcity rather than abundance and a church far too willing locally, domestically, and globally to engage in mindless conflict, far more willing to confess the sins of others rather than facing into the sin of its own self-doubt and fears. And may this die for the Diocese of Washington, this 113th Convention, usher in a new time of congregational growth, missional empowerment, and the emerging desire to see our diocese as the unified body of Christ, rather than 92 separate congregations connected only by our once-a-year gathering as a convention and our occasional regional assemblies. For if we do not see ourselves connected as congregations to one church, the diocese, then we limit the potential and God-given resources that each of our parishes, large and small alike, can bring as an offering to the work of mission and ministry that makes us all stronger, more capable, and more visible as the unified body of Christ in a secular world, a world that too often encourages the selfishness of me and mine rather than the extravagant communion of us and ours. And for all of this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you now know, through Ian Douglas's sermon of last evening, I was invited by Trinity Church Wall Street to attend a convocation in Spain last summer of bishops from the Episcopal Church who share in the active work and mission and ministry with their counterparts in the continent on the continent of Africa. 
26 bishops from the United States, joined with 29 bishops and three primates from Africa for seven days of conversation and worship, Bible study, and fellowship. It was one of the most rewarding, hopeful, and uplifting experiences of my life as a bishop. During our time together, we began to see that although our cultures were often vastly different, our interpretation of Holy Scripture was sometimes problematic, and the Anglican provinces that defined our geographical identity were distant and sometimes governed by primates who had violated our American jurisdictional boundaries. We shared something in common that could not be broken by our differences, our bad behavior toward one another, and our disagreements. Nothing, not one thing, could separate us from our love of God in Jesus Christ. And absolutely nothing could take away from us the timeless gift of the sacrament of the Eucharist that we celebrated daily, binding us together as one people in the sacrifice and resurrection narrative of Jesus Christ. Although we were all very, very different, we were bound together by the sacraments of the Church Catholic and by our common sense of mission. The need for us to work together as one church to bring the saving grace of Jesus Christ to a world broken apart by resources that are either too little or come too late was far greater than those things that defined our differences. We made, during those seven days in Spain, commitments to continue to work together as one church, not many. And it is that commitment that I share with you today at the diocesan level, that we all may be one as the Father and I are one, and that we too, like that diverse gathering of bishops in Spain, have many gifts to share. Now, while in Spain, the Reverend Dr. Ian Douglas was joined by representatives of the staff of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And on one day, speaking before the bishops gathered, Ian posed before us what he said and what he thought were the early stages of the Church experiencing the Second Pentecost, its Second Pentecost. We are now experiencing the empowering engagement of the Holy Spirit in the life of the emerging Christian Church at the beginning of the 21st century. That is happening, as uncomfortable as it is. Now, some would say that that reflection is rubbish. You and I know that two-thirds of the world's population struggles with almost insurmountable poverty issues. And the Anglican Communion seems to make the front pages of the world's newspapers on numerous occasions. And illiterate theological prognosticators are predicting its imminent death by division. Several dioceses in the Episcopal Church have declared their allegiance to bishops in Nigeria, Argentina, Uganda, and Kenya. Church property issues and court battles occupy the interior pages of our local newspapers. Instead of living into communion 
The world too often sees us living into division and conflict. Gathered in Spain last summer, well over 50 bishops and three primates said, enough. But let's take a look locally right now. Right now. What's going on in the Diocese of Washington? We're a long way from Spain. How are we doing? Are we like the bishops last summer, able to focus our work together on the broad scope of shared mission? Are we a diocese in growth or decline? I am so sick and tired of reading statistical reports about the decline of the Episcopal Church that I no longer read them. Because you can do anything you want with statistics at any time, at any place, on any day. So how do we measure our growth as a diocese are we a part of the emergence of the new Pentecost of the 21st century? First of all, I think it bears reminding about who we are. We are 92 congregations in the counties of Prince George's, Montgomery, Charles and St. Mary's in Maryland and in the District of Columbia. Whenever I go to the House of Bishops meeting, in the beginning, Folks in the House of Bishops thought the Diocese of Washington was the District of Columbia. And I remember saying to our presiding bishop, Catherine Jeffrey Shuri, when we had a resolution on the floor that had been produced by me, that the Diocese of Washington was far greater than the District of Columbia. And in the greatness in terms of our size, of who we are, over half or exactly 48, 48 of our 92 congregations have called new rectors since 2002 or are currently involved in the search and call process for new rectors. That's a huge shift in a short period of time. And even with housing costs at all-time highs within the district and in Maryland, the Diocese of Washington continues to attract a very large number of clergy from other dioceses who seek to be called to serve here. We are the receivers of some of the younger, brightest, and best in the Episcopal Church today. That's who you are. But the reality is housing issues for some of our parishes in search and call have become a problem for their new rectors. They have become a problem for all of us. Now, Diocesan Council, on the direction of last year's convention, initiated a study of low-cost housing within the geographical boundaries of this diocese. And the study provides us with important and alarming information about the nature of low-cost housing and even affordable housing. And what I continue to say is the moral crisis that defines the lack of same within this diocese. This study will continue to be used and will be used to study available land within the diocese, some within parish bounds and some available through diocesan control that could be used for development through housing partners such as the Transitional Housing Corporation. This study, and I hope you all will ask for a copy of it from Church House, 
is one of the best and most comprehensive pieces of work that this diocese has ever, ever commissioned. And the time for this diocese to step up to address this moral crisis for the citizens of the District of Columbia and our brothers and sisters in the four counties in Maryland is now. It is up to our parishes who have available land that could be used for such development and this diocese to stop talking and start producing. Now the next question is, how are we doing in congregational growth? and development. Through the very hard and dedicated work of diocesan council and its moderator Jerry Perez and others in the diocese, a very detailed and impressive work was produced for distribution to the diocese on new directions and next steps for congregational growth and development in this diocese. Already we are seeing the positive changes in congregational growth patterns. In the late summer, Canon Cooney and I and our faithful brides attended a magnificent service to bring into the life of this diocese an affiliated parish, All Saints Nigerian Igbo language American Anglican Episcopal Church and Lana Marin. There are two such congregations in the United States. One is in Texas, and it is under the jurisdiction of the primate of Nigeria. This one is dedicated to the life and mission of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. And just to give you a sense of its vitality in life, on any given Sunday, between 350 and 400 souls worship together in this parish, and downstairs, over 120 young people gather for Christian education. It is the fastest growing church in the Diocese of Washington. And I welcome their representatives to this year's convention, and I hope that you will have an opportunity to personally welcome them as well. Their initial goal is to become a mission congregation of the diocese, and in time, a new congregation for all of us. This diocese is changing radically and rapidly. Since 2002, four new Spanish-speaking congregations have been nested within the larger English-speaking congregations of this diocese. They complement the historic and already existent Iglesia San Juan in Lafayette Square, making six operational Spanish-speaking congregations within this diocese. On any given Sunday, in this diocese, when you and I are in our places of worship, between four and five hundred Spanish speakers are worshiping using the Book of Common Prayer and becoming integrated into the life of this diocese. And since 2004, because of the courage of this convention and diocesan council and the staff that I serve, we have been able to establish the full-time position of a Latino missioner to support these congregations and to develop the future growth of Spanish-speaking ministry in this diocese. For this diocese to have moved so quickly and to have had such an impact on this Spanish-speaking population is not only a blessing, but it says a lot about the vision of this diocese for its future. Not too long ago, I received word from a rector in the diocese in one of our counties where there is a large representation 
of Korean speakers. And so very shortly, after being in touch with the Anglican primate of Korea, and after meeting this young Korean priest, there will be an emerging Korean-speaking Episcopal Church nested within an Anglo church in this diocese. And I can tell you, I met with seven Korean priests who were here visiting this part of the country about a month ago. And the priest who will lead this congregation is a church builder and will define once again the richness of the diversity of who we are. Now, there are downsides and upsides to parish growth. In 2002, two parishes and one mission have closed, two by decision of their vestries and one painfully by a decision of diocesan council. It's one of the most painful things a bishop ever has to do is to sit with a vestry and listen to the pain and then say, it is over, but there may be a new beginning. But now one of these parishes has merged with another, and the new congregation will expand its ministry to the Capitol Hill area and will be known by action of this convention last evening, the Church of St. Monica's and St. James. As we recognized and honored the clergy of these two congregations and their vestries, it is a sign that church closings are not a matter of death. They are a matter of new life, and we have to learn how to do it better. But our clergy and our people are leading the way. In 2006, on a cold, windy Saturday, we broke ground in Darnstown, Maryland, for the construction of St. Nicholas Church, the first new parish construction of a new congregation in 40 years in the Diocese of Washington. 40 years. And once final permits have been acquired by that somewhat recalcitrant Montgomery County, uh, you're not from the county, I can be assured, we expect that this new congregation, St. Nicholas Darnstown, will be open to celebrate the birth of our Lord next December. One of our congregations is currently in a shared worship experience with the Lutheran congregation of St. Matthew's downtown, an evangelical Lutheran Church of America. We've been in covenant now for quite some time. We haven't yet learned how to dance with one another. We've got to learn how to dance with one another, and, and I think that this is an opportunity through discussions that are now underway to see whether there might be just the possibility of a real first in this diocese, living into the Lutheran Episcopal Concordat. What a wonderful way to grow in the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. We cannot be insular. We must share the richness of the gospel with our partners. Another thing that you may or may not know is that just a little less than a third of all of our diocesan churches and chapels, 26 to be exact, have or currently are expanding or renovating their facilities for further mission, growth, and ministry in the diocese. And I might add that these parishes have struggled. Most of this work has been done by themselves in capital campaigns, in dinners, and living on the vision of faith and hope. All of this has happened within the last few years. I mean few years. In the District of Columbia, the following parishes are noted for your consumption. St. John's Church, Lafayette Square, currently will undergo renovation 
of his worship center, its church, Church of the Holy Comforter, St. Paul's Church, Rock Creek Parish, St. George's Church, the Church of the Atonement, St. Philip the Evangelist Church, St. Albans Church, St. Paul's Church, K Street, this cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul, and St. Patrick's Church. That's just within the District of Columbia. And in Maryland, the following churches have or currently are expanding or renovating their facilities and have done so over the last several years for the further mission, growth, and ministry in this diocese. You've got to remember, this is a very short timeline. St. Peter's Church, Poolsville. St. John's Church, Chevy Chase. St. Dunstan's Church, Bethesda. St. Luke's Church, Bethesda. Church of the Ascension, Gaithersburg. Church of the Redeemer, Bethesda. Christ Church, Rockville. Church of the Good Shepherd, Silver Spring. St. Luke's Church, Bladensburg. St. Andrew's Church, College Park. Christ Church, Akakik, St. Philip's Church, Baden, Trinity Church, Newport, Old Fields Chapel, Hughesville, St. Andrew's Church, Leonardtown, and Trinity Church in St. Mary's Chapel, St. Mary's City and Ridge. These are really significant accomplishments and are signs of a healthy, mission-driven diocese. And these are the things that usually fly under the radar screen of the parishioners of our diocese. For those who have led these congregations in this work, for their vestries and for their clergy, as the bishop of this diocese, I thank you and I salute you for your hard work and your vision. Since 2003, our work with college students has dramatically increased. Many of you know this, but there are a lot of newbies here. So I want to share this with you again. We have full-time Episcopal chaplaincies at the University of Maryland and Howard University and a part-time paid chaplaincy at Bowie State and a unique chaplaincy for the deaf at Gallaudet University. We have volunteer parish and clergy support for college work at George Washington University and Georgetown University. Our diocesan canon for academic ministries oversees the work of these college chaplaincies and also works directly with over 20 Episcopal affiliated schools, middle, high school, primary, and preschool in the Diocese of Washington. 20 Episcopal Christian schools. He has been directly responsible for moving forward the establishment of the new Bishop John T. Walker School for African American Boys, which will open in September of this year in the 8th Ward of the District, one of the most depressed wards in the District of Columbia. This work is a major achievement for this diocese, and I salute the vision of those who serve on the Walker Board and Preston Hannibal, who has made it a reality. A richness of our diocese, as I said earlier, is its diversity, its racial and its cultural diversity. Some information that you may or may not know. As a diocese of the Episcopal Church, we have one of the largest, if not the largest, numbers of historic African-American churches of any diocese in the United States and one of the largest numbers of ordained persons of color in the Episcopal Church. And to that end, Council will begin in February 
to study the lineage of our seven historic black congregations and will eventually connect that study with work already being developed by the Congregational Development Task Force, which was initiated by Diocesan Council. Truth be told, in looking at the history of these churches, there is much history to be learned, and some of it, my brothers and sisters, is painful, and it is quite challenging. But nonetheless, it will eventually be a significant contribution in helping to define the larger life of this diocese. And it is about time that we have begun this hard work. This study that will be undergone through Council will shed light on the great contributions of black churches, contributions that have made to the mission and ministry of this diocese and the larger Episcopal Church, and likewise the first installment of several writings being developed about the history of African American experience in the diocese prior to the Civil War, even when we were not the Diocese of Washington, but of Maryland will continue, and this study was initiated at my request last year at convention and has been embraced by council, and we are delighted that this study, shortly in its first installment, will be distributed to your congregations so you can begin to learn the story of our heritage. Now, when I think of what it means to be a mission-driven diocese, I think, think about the impact of our 20 Episcopal schools, affiliated schools, and I want to go back to that for a minute. Each day, when these schools are in session, they represent the largest gathered and most diverse congregation in the Diocese of Washington, with over 5,400 students, 1,130 faculty, and 29 ordained and lay chaplains, supported in their work by our host parishes and independent Episcopal schools. Our 29 chaplains remind me that they work not only with the students and faculty, but directly with the students' parents. Our chaplains and school rectors, our pastors, caregivers, and evangelists of the First Order. Too often, they have been overlooked when we celebrate the growing mission and ministry of the Diocese of Washington. So as long as I serve this diocese as your bishop, our Episcopal affiliated schools will receive my highest priority and you will be exposed to their great visibility and mission. They are a very important part of what it means to be a diocese in mission. And I want to thank those chaplains and those rectors and those churches and those standalone institutions who have committed themselves to Episcopal Christian education in the Diocese of Washington, another ministry that has too often been overlooked in this diocese. For those of you who have slept on the hard floor of the cathedral during youth lock-ins, you will know that the heat comes through the floor. And you also will remember that you rarely, if ever, get any sleep. But this has been a success story with the establishment of the position of the Deputy for Youth Ministry way back in 2002. The diocese has been able to reach a significant number of young people in this diocese with almost 80% of our congregations participating on an active basis with this ministry. They participate through, again, these great cathedral lock-ins and our middle school retreats at Camp Letts, where I always get picked on by the kids for not knowing the latest games, so I always lose and also the Triennial Episcopal Youth Event, 
which brings together young people from all over the United States, the Caribbean Basin, Central and South America, and even guests from other parts of the world. This organization, which represents you, has engaged in significant mission trips to the Diocese of Alaska and the Gulf Coast following Hurricane Katrina. And one thing that you need to understand about this work, and it's really important for you to understand, if you haven't heard it from your young people, you will hear it from me now this morning. This important work is always related to the core teaching themes of the gospel of Jesus Christ and consistently focuses on what it means for our young people to engage in the mission of Jesus Christ in the world about them. And for any of you in parishes who have young people who have gone on these trips, they will tell you how their lives have been changed. This summer, this diocese will send a delegation of young people to Texas to represent us at the triennial gathering of youth from around the Episcopal Church. And once again, they will do this diocese proud. I want to thank Paul Kennedy. I want to thank all of the parents who have been chaperones and supporters, our parishes and our rectors, for making this dream a reality for this diocese, again, in a very short period of time. Thank you. In 2003, many of you may remember Bishop uh, Jankukulu Endengani coming here with us to sign a covenant between the Anglican province of Southern Africa not a diocese, but the province consisting of six countries, and this diocese. In 2004, the Diocesan South African Partnership Committee was formed, and this partnership has been actively working in Mozambique, in Swaziland, and the Diocese of the Highveld in South Africa. Currently, there are 11 congregations in this diocese that are directly involved in mission and ministry projects through this partnership. And the Partnership Committee working through the Mothers' Union of Mozambique has recently partnered with our diocesan Episcopal Churchwomen and African Palms of St. John's Church in Olney to help establish a bakery and a truck garden in the sea city of the Diocese of Maputo, Mozambique. And working with Fresh Ministries of Jacksonville, Florida, and United States USAID faith-based, this diocese was instrumental in acquiring the very first PEPFAR grant of $10 million to address the issue of HIV, AIDS, and education in a very troubled part of the world. Also, in partnership with the Center for Global Justice and Reconciliation, which is a significant ministry of this cathedral. The diocese was proud to travel to Mozambique and to play a role in the awarding of an initial $2.5 million President's Malaria Initiative USAID grant for malaria prevention in the Anglican Church of Mozambique, where HIV and AIDS is not the issue. More children and young people die of malaria, a clearly preventable disease, than of any other cause that can be found in that troubled country. And I am proud to have been able to travel to Mozambique to work with this cathedral and to work with the President and the First Lady, not only to acquire this grant, but to make this diocese one of the very few in this country that has been the beneficiary of this largesse of the federal government. There are 13 congregations still engaged actively in the mission work in the Diocese of Honduras, continuing a relationship existing since the time of the late Bishop John T. Walker. Other congregations are involved or becoming involved in the work of mission and ministry in the countries of Haiti, the Dominican Republic, emerging work in Cuba and Namibia. 
Domestically and locally, congregations of this diocese are involved in mission and ministry projects in the Southwest, Native American ministries, the urban ministry programs that are led by Epiphany Church, D.C., Habitat for Humanity, and Christmas in July. The Diocese of Washington, through the generosity and resources of its parishes, has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars and sent hundreds of volunteers to the stricken Gulf Coast regions of Louisiana and Mississippi in the last two years. And when Karen and I were down in Louisiana this past September for a House of Bishops meeting, I want you to know that this diocese ranks as one of the greatest providers of volunteers and money of any diocese in the United States. And we don't have a lot of money, my brothers and sisters. You'll see that when we look at the operating budget. But it is a sign of the commitment of our parishes and people to respond to the needs of God's children wherever they might be. On the international stage, the work of the diocese through the Office of the Bishop and the Cathedral Center for Global Justice and Reconciliation has been a key participant in negotiations with interfaith conversations with religious and political leaders of Iran. To our knowledge, through the knowledge of the White House and the State Department, for whatever reason, we are the only agencies that have a relationship at the present time at the level that we share with this very troubled country and a relationship that has been broken for too many years. In the last year, I've had two visits to Tehran, one to Geneva and one to Oslo, spending a great deal of time finding ways that the Christian and Muslim communities that define our countries, Iran and the United States, can seek ways to grow together rather than being divided by conflict and the potential for war. These trips have been very much made possible by the support of the United States Department of State and have also been supported by the President of the United States himself. Over President's weekend, I will travel to the country of Qatar on an invitation from the Brookings Institution to spend two and a half days in conversation with Islamic and Christian theologians and politicians from around the world to continue to find ways to reduce the tensions and the fear of war in the Middle East where religion too often is the fault line. And I am honored to be able to travel in this junket with Madeleine Albright, with um, Under Secretary of State Nicholas Burns, and with good friend Dr. John Esposito of Georgetown University. Again, this diocese has a visibility beyond just this cathedral and your parishes. And we are about being peacemakers. And that's what Jesus called us to do. And I pray that all of us will work to that end in our own journeys. Telling the story of the mission initiatives and ministry of our parishes and the diocese is important and is supported by the award-winning communications office of this diocese. The linkage of Episcopal Cafe on the web with other Episcopal news and information providers and the publication of the Washington Window have given the Diocese of Washington national and international exposure. Our publications have won multiple awards over the last four years, and our information technology support for the internal and external communications of our parishes is as strong as any in the Episcopal Church today, all in a very short period of time. A diocese engaged in the global mission of Jesus Christ locally, domestically, and globally 
must be a diocese consistently centered in corporate and private prayer. It must be a diocese that sees its parishes as being part of the whole mission of the diocese and the larger church, and not just a diocese where parishes are standalones, living into the concept of independent contractors and local franchises. For any parish in this diocese or the Episcopal Church today, for any parish to be engaged in mission for the 21st century, it must come to recognize that its ministry must extend beyond the local, regional, and domestic environment, but must be connected to the global community as well. The diocese provides the very best and most visible way to do this. The Internet, satellite communications, and almost instantaneous email access throughout the world makes our international neighbors as close to us as our neighbors who live in the house next door to us. We must not become a diocese or a church in isolation interested only in our own parish issues. To do so is to define the slow death of parish ministry in the 21st century. Now, there are a few occasions, quite actually, it's more than a few, many occasions, when I travel around the diocese, and during a parish visit, someone will say, but you know, Bishop, we just can't compete with these non-denominational megachurches that are being built all around us. They surround us on every side. We don't have the resources that they have. And you know, when I drive through the diocese and I drive by some of these huge hockey rinks, um, they're right. Non-denominational megachurches have parking lots that are jam-packed on Sundays. And during the week, they are almost always filled, often with local police directing traffic. Some of these churches have seating capacities of well over 3,000 souls, larger than the seating capacity of this cathedral. But for the moment, do not think parochially. Think about the diocese, the diocese as the church. In the Diocese of Washington, if you were to see the diocese as the church and not those pinheads at Mount St. Albans, you could see it as the church. Our parishes and our supporting congregations would make up, on any given Sunday of worship, 24,000 people. Think about it. 24,000 people. That's on a basic Sunday. 24,000 people attend Episcopal services here in this diocese. And unlike megachurches and non-denominational churches, we are linked together by a common lectionary, mostly common hymns. And you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. And the Book of Common Prayer gifts to us as Anglican Episcopalians. That's the same in every congregation with a few variations every Sunday and on holy days. And when I think of the diocese as the church and our parishes as the congregations, they make up the diocese as the church, then we become much larger than any mega church on any given Sunday or on any given day. And in fact, through the diocese, we are connected throughout the Episcopal Church nationally and with our Episcopal Church neighbors in Mexico, the Caribbean Basin, Central and South America, but we're even larger than that, and we're stronger than that. We are stronger than any non-denominational megachurch in the United States, combined. For we have partners in almost every country in the world. And although we often fight with one another, we are almost 80 million strong, doing the mission of Jesus Christ. So folks, 
Take the blinders off. Do not think parochially. If you do, you could get very depressed. And don't believe what you read in the newspapers about who you are. You know who you are. This is a church that is bringing on the Pentecost of the 21st century. I'll close with this. I remember seven years ago, before I came here, I was visiting a church in Ensenada, Mexico, which is about an hour and a half drive out of San Diego. I had a very good friend who's now the Secretary General of the Mexican Church, the Episcopal Church of Mexico. He was the rector of this small cinder block church with one of those corrugated tin roofs and the windows were just openings that were cut out through the cinder blocks. And the only lighting they had, and they just got it, was a string of 60-watt light bulbs that went from one end of the church to the other, strung over an earthen-worn main aisle. And when I walked into this church for the first time, there was this huge picture of Washington National Cathedral. And then there was another huge picture of Canterbury Cathedral. And so I said to my friend, why are these pictures here? There was nothing else there except these two great cathedrals. And he said, I want to always remind my people that when they enter their small church, that we are a part of something that is much larger than ourselves, something much bigger than we are that we can point to as us. And they did. So going back to the initial questions about the diocese posed at the very beginning of this address, are we growing as a diocese or are we in decline? Having been here now in my six year of consecration, I would say without hesitation, given what I've seen and known, that we are a diocese that is growing in spite of challenging economic times. So how do we measure our growth? If we measure it by money alone, then truth be told, we are a diocese that struggles, like many of our parishes, to balance our annual no-growth budgets. And yet, in all of this, the lack of financial resources has not crippled our ability nor soured us to be creative in growing our mission and ministry in this diocese and beyond. And by God's grace, I believe we have been good stewards of what we have been given. God, Spong wouldn't like this. God knows what it is that we need to do the ministry of Jesus Christ. We may think we know what we need, but God knows. And God's promises never fail. And we will continue to grow as a diocese no matter what the economic realities are that challenge us every day. Our responsibility is to know Christ and to make Christ known. And to be able to share the power of that transforming light to a world that is too often darkened. And it's about time that we continue to get on the horse and ride it hard. I would want to close by saying that next June, you'll find it in your packet, there will be a gathering that we define as a, a gathering of evangelism, which scares the bejesus out of Episcopalians. It's like stewardship or every member canvas. Let's keep thinking of some words that challenge us. But we're going to gather together in June, not as a convention, but brothers and sisters, to be empowered through our gathering on that day with folks who are going to work with us to really continue the growth that has defined this diocese, to become truly a missional church in the 21st century. We're not going to pass out silver bullets, and we're not going to pass out the Kool-Aid either. We're going to pass out the gospel of Jesus Christ that will empower this diocese to be the brightest best light it can be, and to celebrate the gifts of each one of your ministries. 
I want to thank you once again. It's been six years. I want to thank you again for the honor that you have bestowed upon me to be your bishop. I can think of no other place I would rather be anywhere in this church but with you for these times of great challenge and change. God bless you all. You have a 10-minute break. <laughs>